Good evening. Welcome to our Wednesday evening Bible study. Open your Bibles to the book of Revelation 18. We've spent, uh, I think, some at least two, maybe three weeks now on the introduction to this chapter. Now we're going to get into verse by verse uh, study of it. We kind of did an overview, a uh, look at the ancient Babylonian city or the ancient city of Babylon. And so now let's read the first three verses. Revelation 18. Beginning in verse 1, And after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. And the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. And let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for uh, your word, for bringing us to it and preserving it for us. We pray that uh, you'll meet with us and that your Holy Spirit will speak to us through the studying of your word. We draw us closer to Christ, for we ask it all in his name. Amen. All right, so here we have the announcement of God, of judgment on Babylon. It says in verse 1 here, And after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power. Um, great power. His glory is so brilliant. It says, uh, And the earth was lightened with his glory. So his glory is so bright and brilliant, it, it illuminates the whole world. All the earth uh, is lightened by it. Some believe this is uh, referring to Christ. Uh, this is, of course, remember the, the word angel in the Bible means messenger or uh, somebody who's delivering a message. And so uh, Christ certainly is, is capable and qualified and, and fills that, uh, that position sometimes of delivering a message. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be Christ. It can be. Maybe it is. Maybe it isn't. Um, sometimes the Bible remains vague and unspecific on certain things because there's something else there that we need to pay attention to always when Christ is the subject, when Christ is the object, when Christ is in the picture, he is the one that needs all the attention paid to him. All glory belongs to him. And so since Christ is not named here, Although certainly it could be Christ, but he's, he's not named, he's not specifically identified as Christ. That lets us know, okay, there's someone else or something else here that is, is deserving of attention. If it is Christ um, and Christ is not being named by name or title, uh, then there's something else here. What else is 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 in this text in this context in these few verses um, that uh, that merits our attention and so as we look at it, it it becomes evident it's not the messenger that God is focusing attention on here but rather the announcement or the message that is being delivered the announcement that this messenger makes that's what's important and the, that announcement is the proclamation of the downfall of Babylon and it's telling us she has come to the day of her accounting I remember when when Jared was little I mean real little maybe three years old and uh, he was starting to learn about Satan and his evilness his wickedness he may have been a little bit older than that maybe four I don't think he was as old as five but I remember one day he said, why doesn't God just send him to his room? And uh, I thought, what a, what a great question. And of course, Christians for a long time have been wondering, when is that day of reckoning going to come? When is that day of accounting or the, the balancing of the books going to take place? And for the, for the city of Babylon, it's right here in Revelation 18. And she's come to the day of her coming. And I, I told, I remember telling Jared, I said, there's going to come a day where God does send Satan to his room. God has a place prepared for the devil and his angels. 
And there is going to come a day when God sends them there and they will stay there for the rest of eternity. The city of Babylon. Now, keep in mind, this is the political, the commercial aspect of Babylon. We saw in chapter 17 the religious aspect of it. This is the commercial and political aspect of it. And it is full of everything that God hates. In verse 2, it says, uh, And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils. Uh, and so it's, it's, it's a house to all manner of demons, uh, foul spirits. It says the hold of every foul spirit. Now, there's a lot of different um, sinful spirits mentioned in the Bible. Uh, for example, in 1 Corinthians 2, 11, uh, the Bible talks about the spirit of man. Uh, the, our own spirit can be a bad spirit. Uh, <clears throat> uh, 1 Corinthians 2, 12 talks about the spirit of the world. Uh, in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 2, the Bible talks about the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Uh, 1 John 4, 6 talks about the spirit of error. Uh, Romans 8, 15 talks about the spirit of bondage. Uh, there's many different foul spirits. There's many different sinful and wicked and evil spirits that are striving for the mastery of man's mind. They're striving to take control or influence and move and direct uh, people in different directions. Uh, turn with me to 1 John chapter 4. Uh, just a few pages back uh, from the book of Revelation. 1 John chapter 4. And, you know, a lot of people say, well, and, and by the way, there's some what would be considered mainstream religions, and they would be even, you know, if you ask them, they'd say, we are a Christian religion, and they claim special revelation. I'm, I'm getting a revelation from the Spirit, or I'm going to speak in the Spirit, and, and I have no doubt that they're speaking in a Spirit, or they're getting a revelation from a Spirit. Uh, but is it the Spirit of God? Is it the Holy Spirit? Well, if there's any contradiction between what they're saying in this book, they are not getting it from the Holy Spirit of God. By the way, we don't need a special revelation from the Holy Spirit of God because we already have this book. We already have God's Word. And there's nothing that the Holy Spirit would say that would contradict or lead in a different direction from what God has already said. He's not going to contradict himself. So chapter 4, verse 1 in 1 John says, Beloved, believe not every spirit. So just because somebody comes along and says, I'm speaking uh, by the power of the Spirit, we don't have to believe them. We don't have to believe every spirit. Some spirits are, you know, Jesus said, you have your father the devil. He is the father of lies. And, and so there's a, a spirit that's the father of lies. In fact, it goes on and says, but try the spirits. And that doesn't mean like you would try different ice creams. So well, I'm going to try that ice cream, and I'm going to try that one, and I'm going to try that one, and, and see which one I like. What it means is uh, try the way you would try uh, somebody who's been accused of a crime. They face a trial. And so it's saying put them on trial. Uh, prove them. Test them. And, and so try the spirits, whether they are of God. And so you have to put them, how do we know if that spirit is uh, uh, of God or not? Well, is what it is saying matching what the word of God already says? Uh, and, and really, if it doesn't match, then it is not a spirit from God. It is an evil spirit. It's a demon. Uh, masquerading, and you know, the Bible tells us that Satan himself appears as an angel of light. And, and so when there's a, there's a religious organization now, they said, uh, yep, their founder said, uh, the angel of light appeared unto me and gave me this special revelation. And uh, uh, I believe he was telling the truth when he made that statement. And uh, that's exactly what Joseph Smith said, the founder of the, uh, the Mormon religion, or as they like to call themselves, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Um, and, and, and so uh, their whole organization is based on a revelation that the angel of light gave to their founder. Uh, who is the angel of light? Well, the Bible tells us it's Satan. Uh, so that tells you that, uh, and they say, well, we have another book. 
It's a companion. But their book contradicts this book. It's not a new. It's not another testament. It's not a companion to the Bible because there's contradictions. And where they see contradictions, they take their book of having precedence over the words of God in the Bible. And so, uh, uh, do we just accept them? Well, uh, a spirit revealed this to us. No, we put them on trial, and when they're found guilty, we discard them. We say, you know what? You're not. Uh, you're not the spirit of God. You're not from him. Uh, there's a lot of foul spirits. And so we have to uh, discern and tell. And God gives us the truth, the reality, uh, the original uh, to compare to. The, the best way to tell a counterfeit is not, not go around studying all the, all the different counterfeits that they are. Get real acquainted with the real thing. And then when you when you come across a counterfeit, it becomes easy to spot. You know, there's something that looks off, something that feels off, something's not right there because I'm well acquainted with the real thing. Now, we go on here, we continue back in Revelation 18. It says, And he cried with a mighty, uh, mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen. It has become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird a cage of every unclean and hateful bird turn with me back to the book of matthew and there's something interesting here matthew chapter 13. the best way to study the bible is to compare the bible with the bible the best commentary on the bible is the bible itself jesus himself spoke a parable uh, that included some birds in it. We find that here in Matthew 13. We're going to look at verse... Uh, um, well, let's just start in verse 1. The same day went Jesus out of the house and sat by the seaside, and great multitudes were gathered together unto him, so that he went into a ship and sat, and the whole multitude stood on the shore. And he spake many things unto them in parables, saying... Behold, a sower went forth to sow. So here's a farmer. He's got a bag full of seed, and he's going to go out, and he's going to plant that seed. Uh, verse 4. And when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls, in other words, the birds, the fowls came and devoured them up. Now, let's jump forward. Let's fast forward to get the interpretation of this parable. So we go down to verse 18. And he says, Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. He says, Let me explain this parable that I told you about the sower. Verse 19, When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one. Now the very first thing that, that we saw in the parable of the sower was the fowls came. And the seed had been, had been cast there. But it didn't sink in, it didn't take root, it just kind of laid there. The fowls came and they plucked it up and they devoured it. Now here he says this is, this is what that's talking about. Somebody hears the word, they don't understand it. Then cometh the wicked one and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which received seed by the wayside. And so uh, it, I, that wicked one comes. Well, what was the wicked one in the parable? birds it was birds and so jesus gives the representation here of the birds representing uh satan or one of his demons and so they're symbolical of, of satan here and babylon is full of satanic worship just full of it and and satanic power uh at work there its influence the influence of babylon has gone worldwide it's an interesting thing because at the time that God is giving this writing to us here on earth, he's using John, uh, the beloved, to write this. It would be very difficult for any one city to have a planet-wide influence. Um, I, I mean, and there was, there was people that tried to conquer the whole planet. That's History is replete with people that have attempted that. Uh, the Roman Empire got pretty close. Uh, they failed in some things. Of course, Hitler wanted to conquer the whole planet. Napoleon wanted to conquer the whole planet. And history is littered with people that have wanted to 
conquer the whole world. I want to rule the whole world. Um, and I, I at least want to influence and change and, and be able to control some things. And that's been a, a very, very difficult and, and up till now an impossible thing. But now, one city indeed can influence the whole planet. And you say, well, how would it come on the scene so quickly and have that type of influence so quickly? I, I remember one day there was no Silicon Valley, and the next day there was Silicon Valley. And the whole world has been influenced by the technology that was de uh, developed in that small little uh, area of the world. And, and is still being influenced by a lot of that technology. And, and boy, things happen so very, very quickly now. Uh, one day there was flip phones, and the next day there was smartphones. And, and the, the cell phone technology has been revolutionized. It happened pretty much overnight. Um, there was a day when, when somebody told my dad, they said, there's gonna come a day when nobody is gonna have a landline. And he thought that was pretty comical. Well, we're pretty much there. Very, very few people have an actual landline telephone. Now, businesses have them because they need more than one phone line and they use their phone line for some different things, uh, faxing and things like that. But most households today, in, in America at least, don't really have a landline phone. Uh, they have, you know, why have two phone bills? I'm gonna have a cell phone well, I have a landline also in addition to that. And uh, now the exception might be some uh, very remote areas where there's not really cell phone signal, uh, but those areas are becoming fewer and fewer. And so what I'm saying is things in the world now can happen pretty instantly. A city can be built very quickly. A power can be built very quickly. Um, just, just think about how quickly uh, one man has revolutionized many different things, uh, electric vehicles, um, space, traveling to space. And he said, I want to develop uh, more economical space travel so we, can, so, so we can have the technology to colonize Mars. That's his goal. He wants to build cities on Mars so that he can uh, have things delivered there, I don't know, maybe by Amazon or something. Um, and, and now he's developing uh, his own type of cell phone. Uh, so people can install Twitter to it and, and make him more and more money. But uh, how quickly one individual, one location, one city can, can rise up and all of a sudden become a, a world-influencing power. And that's what Babylon uh, will have done at this point uh, politically and commercially, business-wise. And in fact, as a city or as an organization, whether it's a literal city or not, uh, doesn't really matter. As a system, it has become the pride of the world. Making the nations rich through the abundance of her delicacies, as it says there at the end of verse 3. The people of the earth have drunk of her cup for so long that they don't have the power, they don't have the ability, they don't have the desire or the will to resist her. The world will have become completely intoxicated with this great Babylonian system. And God's going to say, that's enough. That's enough. We're not going to have any more of this any longer. And so he sends this angel uh, <clears throat> having great power and that lights up the whole earth with his glory to deliver this message. Babylon's coming down. And, and uh, it is about to be destroyed uh, and, and, I'm, and God is going to do it himself. We're going to stop right here. We'll pick up at verses 4 through 8, uh, Lord willing, next week. And so I encourage you to read through that, study it, become uh, very familiar with that passage. And let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for your word, your promises, uh, the, uh, the things that you let us know are going to come to pass. We thank you for your love, for your mercy and grace right now. But God, we also thank you for your justice uh, and that you will uh, deal accordingly with those that need it. We pray that uh, you'll help us to study your word, to live for you, and to point others to Christ. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord bless you.